Hi, everyone, and welcome to Microbial Minutes for January 28th, 2019. This is Julie Wolf, the Science Communication Specialist at the American Society for Microbiology, and we're here to talk about what's hot in the microbial sciences. We have two major questions that we're going to address on our next slide, slide two, uh, and those are, does infection lead to Alzheimer's disease? And where do drug-resistant infections come from? These are questions that have been answered with recent pieces in the literature. Let's dive in on slide three. Here we're going to address the question of whether Alzheimer's disease has an infectious agent at its root by looking at a paper from Science Advances. The take home message is that based on this research, there may be an infectious agent that causes or is associated with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and there are many different pieces of information that have led up to this hypothesis. So for example, neurosurgeons tend to get Alzheimer's disease at a higher rate than other uh, surgeons. And if two people in a romantic relationship, um, if one of the, the people in that relationship comes down with Alzheimer's disease, the partner of that person is at much greater risk for also contracting Alzheimer's. And so both of those things in combination with the presentation of the disease have made people, many scientists, question about whether or not there is some sort of infectious agent that is uh, maybe not necessarily a definitive cause, but associated with infection or associated with disease. Uh, so this paper begins by talking about the presentation of Alzheimer's disease in the brain. Alzheimer's disease, uh, re it results in neurodegeneration, and that's in part because of the inflammatory response that is going on in the brain. This inflammatory response will eventually lead to formation of uh, plaques and misforming of certain proteins, um, but some of the inflammation uh, activation pathways that are seen, things like the inflammasome, certain complement pathways, and uh, microglia activation are consistent with microbially activated inflammatory pathways, suggesting that maybe there's an infectious agent at the root. It's been well described that patients who have uh, porphyromonas gingivalis infection, which can cause chronic periodontitis, can also be at greater risk for Alzheimer's disease. And this has been shown not only with um, human associations, where people will look at uh, various patient populations and cohorts and compare those to uh, whether or not that increases one's risk, but also in mice. So in mice that do not have the APOE gene, that's the gene that's typically associated with greater risk for Alzheimer's disease. When mice are given porphyromonas uh, gingivalis orally, they can sometimes come down with Alzheimer's disease or a similar mouse version where they will have the neurodegeneration, certain types of memory impairment, as well as brain infection and inflammation from the uh, microorganisms itself. And this is specific to P. gingivalis uh, with other species that have been tested, that same brain infl uh, inflammation and neurodegeneration has not been observed. So P. gingivalis is something that can colonize people who have um, periodontitis, as I mentioned, but it's not only found in people who have periodontitis. You can carry it without having any clinical presentation. It's a, a gram-negative microbe that likes to live anaerobically in the uh, very deep gingiva uh, within the teeth. So it's, it's not something that you could necessarily scrub away with your twice daily tooth brushings. Um, but because of those tooth brushings, there will be very small abrasions uh, that occur. And this, is, this has been well characterized as well, not only with the P. gingivalis, but with many different oral bacteria. And during that morning or nighttime toothbrush um, activity, there will be a transient small level of bacteria that can go into the blood. This is not normally a, a cause for um, concern, but this is one way that P. gingivalis may be able to transit from the oral cavity into the bloodstream. Now, to cause disease, P. gingivalis has a number of different virulence factors, but its major virulence factor is the gingipanes, which is a, a family of secreted proteases. They are cysteine proteases that can chew up and cleave different um, proteins of the host. And scientists have also shown that blocking gingipanes can reduce the virulence of this bacterium. So let's look at the um, the evidence from this particular paper that P. gingivalis is associated with Alzheimer's disease in slide four. Here, the authors formed the hypothesis that P. gingivalis infection can act um, in Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis 
through secretion of those gingivines to promote that neural damage. Uh, and they looked at different cohorts of patients who have Alzheimer's disease and those that don't. Uh, they, they took um, the brains of people who had passed away from Alzheimer's disease and those who hadn't and looked at whether or not there were antibodies within their brain. Uh, and what they observed was that greater gingipane immunoreactivity immuno uh, was seen within the patient cohort of those people who had had Alzheimer's disease. Um, they were also able to identify the DNA of the bacterium within those Alzheimer's uh, disease brains. And then they looked at patients who had been diagnosed as possibly having Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a little bit um, uh, hard to diagnose in the present time because it often has to do with the brain architecture, and that's really a postmortem diagnosis. But based on family history and uh, behavior, there's patient cohorts who are likely to have Alzheimer's disease, and so they looked at the central uh, spinal fluid of these patients and also saw that P. gingivalis DNA, um, suggesting that should P. gingivalis be uh, associated with the formation of this disease or the, the um, occurrence of this disease, then it might be a potential biomarker for people who genuinely have Alzheimer's disease and differentiate that from other forms of dementia. Um, one of the things that they did uh, not in human populations was to look at that Alzheimer's model with mice. So they took um, mice and infected them with P. gingivalis, and then they would treat them with a gingipane inhibitor. So a small molecule that can stop that protease from doing its, uh, its thing within the, within the host. Uh, now this gingipane inhibitor can cross the blood-brain barrier, which is very important for activity of, of any type of thing that is supposed to be active in the brain. And what they saw was that it decreased um, the symptoms within the mice. It also decreased, uh, as shown in the figure on the right-hand side, both the amount of DNA, uh, the bacterial DNA in the mouse brains, and it increased the neuron number, so the, the number of surviving um, cells within the brain, so that there was less cell death. And you can see that after 10 weeks, there was a significant decrease within um, the neurons, the mouse neurons, and that with addition of various inhibitors and inhibitor combinations uh, that they were able to rescue the, the neuron survival. So from this, um, going on to slide five, uh, this was covered within New Scientist, uh, a magazine that is you know, generally for uh, a lay audience. And it talks about how we may finally know what causes Alzheimer's and how to stop it, uh, which would be wonderful. It would be uh, amazing if this turns out to be something that, a, a disease that we could treat with an inhibitor to one of the microbial products. Of course, a lot more research has to go in to verifying this and to having it reproducible, reproducibly shown by other um, groups. But there is a, um, there is a research uh, trial going on right now with a vaccine. It's either just started or about to start, I can't recall, looking at a, a cohort of individuals in Australia who are going to get a vaccine for Porphyromonas gingivalis. This is actually not related at all to Alzheimer's disease. It has to do with preventing um, periodontitis, which itself can be a very um, lifestyle inhibiting and, and potentially bad, um, very bad disease. Uh, but what the scientists will be able to do is to follow that cohort and see whether or not they have decreased incidence of Alzheimer's disease, which would be more support that in fact, this particular microbe is at the root of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now, if it sounds a little bit familiar, like maybe you've heard recently that Alzheimer's disease is caused by an infectious agent, that's because there were actually some studies that came out in, in the fall of last year. In September, there was uh, two different studies that were published in the, um, in the journal Neuron, and they were covered in This Week in Virology. So I've included a link, which you can find below this session if you want to click and listen to a more in-depth discussion of the research. But in those studies, the scientists identified um, human herpes virus, I believe it was six, and human herpes virus eight, as being more highly associated with patients who have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and this has to do in part with some of the beta amyloid activity, which has been shown to be an antimicrobial, uh, has some antimicrobial properties. Uh, and so it might, it might actually be that the inflammatory response causes the accumulation of these beta amyloid plaques, which are indicative of uh, Alzheimer's disease in the end. Um, the, the idea, as I mentioned, that uh, an, an infectious agent is at the root of Alzheimer's disease is not new. Uh, there have been associations uh, between various different types of microbes uh, 
Uh, and there's actually a contest, that uh, competition, which is self-funded by a scientist, Dr. Leslie Norens, as you can see at the bottom there. Uh, and he has offered $1 million of his own money if someone can demonstrate, if a team or a, a scientist can demonstrate that there is actually an infectious agent associated with Alzheimer's disease that could lead to some sort of improvement in therapy for those patients. And that is to be announced sometime in the next two years. So I anticipate that this is not the last that we will hear uh, about an infectious cause for Alzheimer's. <coughs> Moving on to slide six. So our question for this one, uh, for that, that this piece of research raises is where do drug, uh, drug resistant infections come from? And what this particular piece of data, MBIO, it's a, a journal article that was published last week, suggests is that drug resistant bacteria of livestock rarely cause very serious illnesses known as bloodstream infections or BSI in humans. Now where drug resistant infections in the human population come from has been a question that we've addressed previously on Microbial Minutes. Uh, back in September, we suggested or we covered a paper that suggested a link between urinary tract infections and E. coli, looking at the connection between meat products uh, and the uh, infected isolates or the drug-resistant isolates within those particular meat products and uh, the correspondence within the human population. Livestock are well known to be a reservoir for drug resistance because they are given many drugs as part of their diet, sometimes prophylactically. Um, in the U.S., it is now only prophylactically. Uh, it is prophylactically and not as um, growth uh, en enhancers. Uh, but whether this results in a more serious consequence in the clinic is something that this group wanted to ask. They wanted to look at whether, in addition to a potential link with UTIs, there is also a link with BSIs. And so they collected a number of different E. coli isolates from farms, um, 431 to be exact, and they collected over 1,500 E. coli isolates from humans who had uh, bloodstream infections. And this was done in England. You can see in the right-hand side where all of these different, um, where these different isolates were taken from, both the human and the uh, livestock. And they took it from a number of different livestock, from cattle, uh, turkeys, um, uh, uh, chickens, et cetera. And they looked at the relatedness of these different isolates. And that's also graphed. It's a little bit perhaps not uh, intuitive, but if you look at the um, inside ring, that says the source of where they took the isolate from. And if you look on the outside, oh, I'm sorry, the outside ring, that's where they took the isolate from. The inside ring is the association of that particular isolate. Generally, it is associated as a human strain, a livestock strain, or a meat strain. Uh, and you can see that by and large, the human uh, strains seem to come from humans, right? Or the human blood strains come, tend to come from human. Um, whereas there's a lot more interaction between the different livestock strains. Uh, so it's, it's more likely that um, turkeys and chickens, for example, on the same farm might be passing the isolates between one another. Moving on to the next slide, slide seven to investigate their question about whether there is an association between livestock and humans, they looked at the core genomes of these E. coli isolates. So they compared the genes that are most commonly found in all E. coli strains. Uh, and they looked at the difference at the nucleotide level. So they were looking for differences in single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Uh, and from this comparison, they were able to see that livestock and patient isolates are genetically distinct. So as shown on the right, you can see the web of relatedness and where those SNPs would occur. You can see that, that mostly uh, they group together so that the livestock strains are more closely related to other livestock strains and the human strains are more closely related to human strains. Um, what this uh, suggests is that, uh, as, as I said before, livestock on the same farms can share related isolates, but that E. coli that cause those bloodstream infections are not directly originating from livestock strains. That, however, does not mean that the antibiotic resistance isn't developing on the farms and then being passed into a strain that can infect humans more readily. So to test that, they looked at the accessory um, genes, things that are on mobile genetic elements, things like plasmids or transposons, that will harbor drug resistance genes, as well as other characteristics such as virulence factors. In total, they found 41 resistance genes among all the isolates that they looked at, um, and they saw a pretty low prevalence of shared genes. Uh, and so looking down in the, the bottom um, figure, 
what they're looking at is the, the gene for tetracycline uh, resistance called TETB. Uh, and they're looking at whether the strain from the source had, the, uh, the strain, had that particular gene um, or an allele of that particular gene and where that um, strain is normally found. And you can see that for the most part, the human blood um, isolates are human strains, human associated TETB alleles but that occasionally you can see a different color, like one, one or two little marks within there that suggest that it may have come from another source, that although the human strain may have human strain lineage, it may have picked up um, rarely a gene of resistance from another source. And so what this suggests is that there's limited evidence for drug-resistant infections associated with human serious um, infections like bloodstream infections that originate from livestock within this region. And so this um, might seem a little bit confusing because we have talked about how UTIs seem to be uh, fairly well established to have originated within um, livestock and then pass that strain or, or at least um, certain strains onto uh, human hosts. So in slide eight, there was a, a discussion on social media that I found very interesting uh, from both Alan McNally and Willem von Schaik, both of these scientists um, do genomics of these same types of infections quite regularly. And in fact, somebody asked um, Willem von Schaik, they said, the results are different from yours. What is the difference? Um, and I think down at the, the penultimate um, tweet in that thread from, from von Schaik says, um, my major, ah, yes. Um, I'm sorry, he, he then answers and says, I may miss something, but this is very much in line. Um, no overlap of strains, but plasmids can be identical. And then in the penultimate tweet, says, yes, I agree. My major concern for antibiotic use in agriculture is the mobile genetic elements that may transfer to human strains. Even though it seems to happen very rarely in this particular case, uh, it doesn't take many times of it passing into the human strain population in order for that to spread um, within the human uh, lineages. Uh, and so that's going to wrap up our microbial minutes. Um, on our final slide, we will summarize uh, that we learned today that Alzheimer's disease may have an infectious agent at its root, uh, and that drug-resistant bacteria of livestock rarely cause very serious bloodstream infections in humans. Now, uh, again, you may notice that we're changing the format just a little bit so that we're covering two stories every week. If you want to hear summaries or contexts of a study that's published this week, feel free to leave us a link down below. And if you want to follow um, more interesting uh, studies that are coming out from researchers in real time, follow us on Twitter. Uh, we'll be at ASM BioThreats tweeting about some of the research that we see there. Thanks, and see you next time on Microbial Minutes.